Or you're hurting and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of self? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Is anyone? Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of is risen Oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ cross as you wait for the crown tell the world of the treasure you found so last week we began a new series looking at the book of mark and we started by looking at how mark explains that the gospel doesn't begin when jesus arrives on the scene but it begins in the old testament when jesus is foretold 
what we ended by saying is that this Messiah that has arrived is going to be different from what the people expected. See, what they expected was a conquering warrior king, much like David, who was going to come in and wipe out the enemies of Israel and establish a new glorious kingdom of Israel. But that's not what Jesus came to do. What Jesus came to do was to be a suffering servant king who came into the world to save us from our own sins. But in this next part, we're going to look at how Mark establishes Jesus' authority as the Messiah. So it begins with Jesus calling some of his disciples, and then Jesus enters into the synagogue in Capernaum, and he starts to preach. And while he's preaching, the people are astonished because he was teaching as someone with authority. Now what this means is that Jesus was, was not just preaching as maybe a pastor would preach where they, they've done a lot of studying and understand the text and, and teach you what's in there like I do, but what he's doing is explaining it perfectly because he knows it perfectly and he'll clarify every little detail that we might get wrong. And then a a demon-possessed person is among the people in this synagogue, and this demon cries out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So we got this demon going, I know who you are. You are, basically, you are the Messiah. But Jesus says to him, Silence, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulses and, and then comes out of him. It says, that they were arguing with one another, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And it says his fame spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. So here Jesus establishes two things. One, he has authority over Scripture. Two, that he has authority to cast out demons. That he has authority over the dark forces and uncleanliness of this world. He's already showing us what he's come to do. It's come to get rid of the darkness. And then after that, he goes to the house of Simon Peter, where his mother is sick, and he heals her. And it says that the whole town assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, why would Jesus do that? Remember, they know who he is, but demons also spew out lies and they'll want to derail whatever they think Jesus is trying to do. So they're going to spew out lies about who this Messiah is. They're going to twist it all up and confuse people. So Jesus is not giving them that privilege. And then he's, he, he's approached by a man with leprosy. And the man begs him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And it says that Jesus is moved with compassion and he reaches out his hand and touches him and says, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately the man is made clean, but Jesus sternly warns him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer what Moses prescribed for your cleansing as a testimony to them. So Jesus also doesn't want the people he healed to go around spouting off that Jesus has healed them. Now, why would he not want that? Well, he doesn't want it because he doesn't want um, people to get the wrong idea of who he is. Because he's coming not just for this type of healing. He's coming to heal us of our brokenness because of sin. And yes, in the end, for those who are in Christ, we are going to be completely healed of all of our earthly maladies when, when we are in the new heavens and the new earth, when, when he makes all things new. But... For now, Jesus doesn't want them to miss the point. They can, they can get caught up in the fact that he's just this healer, but he's coming for so much more than that. But he went out and began to proclaim it widely, uh, not Jesus, but the man who was healed, um, and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. But he was out in deserted places, and they would come to him from everywhere. So Jesus could no longer enter places openly because there was just so many people demanding of his, of his healing and his time and everything else. 
And so Jesus stayed in, in the desert places and people came to him anyway. So Jesus doesn't need to, to go to places. People are coming to him. That's how amazing the things that he's doing are. Well, there's something that we can maybe be confused about. And that's, that's like, why are these people telling people about this stuff when he's saying don't tell people? Well, it's probably because the things that Jesus were doing, was doing, the things were so remarkable so incredible, so amazing that they couldn't help but tell people what had happened. I don't know about you, but if I had been healed of, of a disease that kept me cut off from, from my friends and family because it was contagious, and, and if I had been healed from that and allowed to re-enter, I'd be telling everybody who healed me and why. People can't help but share that this amazing preacher who is casting out demons and healing people is walking around the countryside. They couldn't help it because Jesus is so amazing. So Jesus has established his authority to preach, to cast out darkness, to cast out demons, and his authority to heal people. And then finally, he's going to do, do one more claim to authority. And these are all things that are godly authority. And he goes into Capernaum again and is preaching in a house where there's so many people that th this, this group of guys come with their friend on a stretcher who's paralyzed and they can't get in to get him healed. So they climb onto the roof and rip open the roof and lower this guy onto the floor. And it says this, seeing their faith, the friends, not the person, not the paraplegic. Jesus told the parapl paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does he speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus understood in his spirit what they were reasoning and said to them, why are you reasoning like this in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your stretcher and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up, picked up his stretcher, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astonished and gave glory to God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So Jesus' final way of establishing his authority is to forgive sins. Here's what, what I want you to remember from, from this section. And that's the, this, this establishment of Jesus' authority. This book gives us more and more about who Jesus is and how we should understand him. That he has authority to do all these things, but he came not to glorify himself uh, on earth, but to, but to glorify the Father and to save us so that he would be glorified in heaven. He comes to suffer so that he is glorified later. And so here's my, my final two questions for you. How often do you show kindness and love to people at the expense of your own comfort? And two, when's the last time you got so excited about the fact that you have been redeemed from death, from eternal punishment by the, by the thrice holy almighty God of the universe, and you just couldn't help but explain and share it? And maybe we're afraid to do that sometimes, and that's okay. But I think that we should be excited about the fact that we know Jesus, that we are named and known by him. So think about those things this week. Next week, we're going to look at the growing opposition that Jesus faces as the Messiah and suffering servant of God. All right, we'll see you next time.